Let me just begin with the, the motivation for what I, what I want to talk about. So I, there are very few theorems, in fact there aren't any theorems, but it's a program I want to kind of outline, uh, which, where I think there's something very interesting going on. So it starts with what are called higher Teichmuller spaces. So these are uh, a situation where you have a, a compact surface, sigma, and you look at the uh, character variety, the space of representations of pi 1 in, uh, in the group SLNR, modulo conjugation. So this is, if you like, the moduli space of flat SLNR connections on, on the surface. And it turns out that there is a, a, a component of this, which is uh, diffeomorphic to Rn, where n is this, this number, and uh, is an analogous to, uh, to Teichmuller space. In fact, when n is equal to 2, uh, it is Teichmuller space. So this component consists precisely of the, the representations into SL2R, which correspond to uniformizing uh, the Riemann surface, or equivalently looking at uh, the hyperbolic metric on that surface. And uh, so the question is, what does the geometry for n greater than 2 parametrize? So these spaces are here. I found them a long time ago by using the, in fact, the technique of uh, Higgs bundles. But ever since then, um, or let's say more recently, the past 10 years, a number of people have looked at these uh, from very different points of view. They've proved a lot of things about these spaces, that, uh, for example, the uh, action of the mapping class group is very nice, and uh, it, somehow they, they should parameterize some differential geometric structure on the surface, modulo diffeomorphisms. And uh, apart from n equals 2 and, in fact, n equals 3, um, well, I, uh, there's not a satisfactory answer as far as I'm concerned. Now, I have to say that uh, Labori, uh, Wienhardt, Guichard, and others have actually produced some geometric structure which does correspond to these components, but it's uh, expressed in a, a kind of dynamic, dynamical point of view uh, in terms of the representation and not quite in the way that I would, I would like in terms of some structure on the surface, modulo diffeomorphism. I mean, it's, it's a great achievement what they've done, but, uh, but it's not quite in the language that I expected. So uh, what I thought was, uh, uh, what can we do when n is equal to infinity? And of course, you may well ask, what does that mean? Right, what is SL infinity R? And uh, that's one of the issues that, uh, that we somehow one needs to suppress in this, because what I want to do is to uh, kind of look at the, uh, at the way in which the origins of these components, by using Higgs bundles, the way it applies to uh, uh, what's called the SU infinity. So let, let me, uh, let me uh, describe to you what I mean by the group SU infinity. So this is, this is supposed to be analogous to a compact group, whereas it's much more problematic to discuss what SL infinity R is, uh, but I'll come on to that later. So what do I mean by uh, SU infinity? Well, what I really mean is this, that if you look at the uh, symplectic diffeomorphisms of the two-sphere, uh, then this has many of the features of a compact Lie group. So what is the, the Lie algebra of this? So the two-sphere is simply connected, uh, so we're, we're looking at Hamiltonian vector fields, so they depend on a function modulo constants. So the Lie algebra is really the functions on the two-sphere modulo the constants, where the bracket is the Poisson bracket of two functions. And uh, SU2, or rather, really PSU2, SO3, sits inside here. And if you decompose uh, the Lie algebra, namely the functions on the two-sphere, under the action of SO3, then, of course, what you get are the spherical harmonics. There's the, the if you like, the three-dimensional irreducible representation plus the five plus the seven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the Lie algebra breaks up under the action of SO3 in these uh, irreducible pieces uh, with multiplicity one. Uh, on the other hand, suppose you look at uh, SUN and you think of the homomorphism from SU2 to SUN which is given by the irreducible n-dimensional representation of SU2. Then if you break up the Lie algebra of SUN under this action, then you get the 3 plus the 5 plus the 7, but of course it terminates at 2n minus 1. 
So there's a sense in which, as, especially with regard to this distinguished SU2 inside, or SO3 inside this group, that, uh, uh, that we, we should somehow define SU infinity as the asymptotic diffeomorphisms. So there'll be an equation coming up later which will somehow justify that. Anyway, for the moment, it's, uh, it's just a, an analogy. And I, what I, but really what I want to do is to think that uh, this symplectic diffeomorphism to the two-sphere is an analog of a compact group. Now, this idea has gone back a long, a long way. In particular, it appears uh, quite a lot in uh, Simon, some of Simon's papers. Uh, so the thing to remember is that the Poisson bracket on these, uh, so this, this space sits inside uh, the Lie algebra of SU infinity, but the brackets, far, apart from the three-dimensional one, are not the, uh, the Lie bracket in SUN, but they are the Poisson brackets. And there are some universal formulas which relate uh, one to the other. Okay, so why, why should we think of this as being like uh, a compact group? Well, first of all, there's an invariant metric. So given two functions, f and g, we can integrate them over the two-sphere relative to the symplectic form. And also, uh, we have invariant polynomials. So this is analogous to taking the the trace of the nth power of, of a matrix. So we just take the function, uh, take its nth power, and integrate. So uh, that's the respect in which, in which we can think of this as being like a compact group. Uh, but the problem is that uh, there's no uh, complexification as a group. And in particular, if I want to think of SL infinity R, then that sits inside SL infinity C, and uh, that would, would be a complexification of SU infinity, but it doesn't exist, but there are, in certain mathematical problems, there are substitutes for that. Uh, okay, so I want to also talk about uh, the group SO infinity. So SON is uh, the fixed point set of an involution in SUN. Uh, so uh, what are we going to talk about? How are we going to talk about that? So what I want to think of SO infinity as is the, uh, we have this involution here, which is just reflection in an equator, and uh, on the two-sphere, and SO infinity should be the, uh, the diffeomorphisms, symplectic diffeomorphisms that commute with this reflection. So the Lie algebra consists of the the odd functions, because in fact this, uh, this involution takes a symplectic form to its inverse, to its minus itself, and so uh, to get the vector field from the function, you use the symplectic form on the derivative. So if the function is odd, then the vector field is even, and therefore commutes with the involution. And if I decompose the Lie algebra of uh, SU infinity, then into the Lie algebra of SO and its orthogonal, then these are the even functions. So you can think of these as being like uh, self, uh, self, well, anyway, that's just the, the decomposition. Uh, one point to note is that SO infinity preserves the fixed point set, the equator. So there is a, a homomorphism from SO infinity to the diffeomorphisms of the circle, which is kind of interesting because uh, this group doesn't have the properties. So there's no nice invariant uh, in a product on this group, although there is on this. So this is rather different from representations of a compact group, for example. Anyway. Uh, okay, so I want to use the, the theory of Higgs bundles, and I want to substitute for the gauge group in this theory uh, S in SU infinity, namely the symplectic diffeomorphism of the two-sphere, and then I want to see what kind of geometry that corresponds to. So in fact, when you, usually when you do this, when you substitute a, a gauge group for a diffeomorphism group, you get some metric theory. Some you, gauge theory becomes gravity. So we'll, we'll see what happens in this case. Uh, so let me remind you. So this is what I mean by a uh, Higgs bundle. So we have now a compact Riemann surface. So our surface now has a complex, complex structure. I have a compact group G and a principal G bundle with connection over sigma. And then I have this Higgs field here, which is, uh, is best to write as a, a one zero form on the Riemann surface with values in the Lie algebra. And the equations are that uh, the D bar operator, the holomorphic structure 
on this bundle of Lie algebras uh, determined by the connection, by the zero one part of the covariant derivative, that using that con complex, that holomorphic structure, the Higgs field should be holomorphic, and that uh, it satisfies, together with the curvature of this uh, G connection, it satisfies this equation here. And so these equations have been around uh, for many years now, almost 30 years, and uh, um, okay, they've actually generated uh, quite a number of interesting results. Now, uh, the link with, uh, in fact, the way in which uh, these distinguished components of the space of flat connections was found was uh, because of this, uh, this other point of view, that suppose you have a solution to those Higgs bundle equations, and then uh, you look at this connection here. So this one is, if you like, if, if G is the unitary group, then this is a unitary connection, so the phi plus phi star is self-adjoint rather than skew-adjoint. So this way, what you get is a, a connection with uh, holonomy in the complexified group, GC. And the equations, uh, when you sp spell them out, tell you that this is a flat GC connection. So from a Higgs bundle, which is a complex holomorphic object, if you can solve the equations, then you find yourself a, uh, uh, with a, a flat connection, and therefore a representation of the fundamental group into GC. Uh, and uh, conversely, if you're given, in fact, a, what's called a reductive representation, then the, equa the same equations correspond to having a harmonic section of this uh, bundle of symmetric spaces, and that's, uh, that, because that comes back and you rearrange the solution to find a solution to the Higgs bundle equation. So basically, uh, you can go from representations of the fundamental group via harmonic maps to a solution to the Higgs bundle equations, or you can go from the holomorphic data satisfying some stability condition to a, a solution to the Higgs bundle equations either way. Uh, now, suppose you want to get uh, a connection, a flat connection, whose holonomy lies in the a real form of GC then, uh, of course, this will be some subspace of the modernized space of flat GC connections, then what you need to do is this, that you look at your real form, you take the maximal compact subgroup H of the real form, and you, your connection, this connection, should reduce to H, but that the Higgs field should lie in the orthogonal part in the Lie algebra, should lie in the M. So when you do that, then you get uh, your flat connection when you write this thing down. Uh, has holonomy in the, in the real form, GR. Okay, and here's, here's a standard example. It's really the sim simplest example of a, of a Higgs bundle. Your vector bundle, so now we're looking at the group SU2. So we can think of this as being a connection on a rank 2 vector bundle, a rank 2 complex vector bundle. In this case, if you take the uh, square root of the canonical bundle plus its dual, and uh, you take your Higgs field to look like this, so this is actually a canonical object because it's a homomorphism from this one to this tends to the canonical bundle, so one makes perfectly good sense there. Then uh, you take a U1 connection, A on K to the half, so that means going to the uh, maximal compact of SL2R, and your Higgs field here is actually in the orthogonal part. It's, well, it's basically symmetric, but symmetric with respect to a, a form which is not diagonal. Then you get a, your equations, your Higgs bundle equations, are equivalent to the fact that the curvature of this U1 connection, which is basically a Riemannian connection, is minus 1. And so, it's the, uh, so what you get then is a hyperbolic metric, and the corresponding flat connection is just given by the, the uniformizing uh, representation. So, so that's, the, that's the simplest example. Here. So if, if you take a hyperbolic metric on a uh, Riemann surface, then you can rewrite it as a solution to these uh, Higgs bundle equations. Okay, so now, what did I say? I said that we wanted to replace uh, the gauge group uh, G, the compact group G, by SU infinity. So, uh, what does that mean, geometrically? So, first of all, what is an SU infinity connection? So, 
it's a connection whose holonomy is the symplectic diffeomorphisms of the two sphere. So you think of that in terms of the, uh, uh, of the associated uh, two sphere bundle. So we have a four manifold fibering over our surface. We need a symplectic form along the fibers. So we need, uh, that's what this is. And the connection is given by a horizontal subbundle of the tangent bundle of M itself, horizontal with respect to this uh, projection. So what that means is that if we take, uh, if we take a, uh, a curve in sigma, lift it horizontally, then uh, the parallel translation is uh, a diffeomorphism of the fiber, the two-sphere fiber. Uh, if we want, we want it to be a symplectic diffeomorphism, so we want to say that for each horizontal lift of a vector field, the lead derivative of this two-form along the fibers is equal to zero. So, so basically, we're looking for a four-dimensional manifold with a distinguished horizontal subbundle to the tangent bundle. Uh, what about SO infinity? Well, there, of course, we want to reduce to this uh, the uh, the diffeomorphisms that commute with this involution. So we want this uh, involution on the fibers, this anti-symplectic involution on the fibers. Uh, in this case, the fixed point set is a circle bundle over sigma, and so, uh, but we still have a horizontal subspace, so we can think of that as, if you like, the diff S1 connection associated to the homomorphism from SO infinity to the diffeomorphism to the circle. Okay, so that's the connection. What, what about the other part of the Higgs bundles? Uh, what about a, an SU infinity Higgs field? So locally, uh, what is this? So uh, the Lie algebra we think of as the functions on the two-sphere modulo constants. So, uh, so what does a, a Higgs field look like? Here, I've, this is the real Higgs field. Um, well, the phi i are supposed to be functions on the base with values in the Lie algebra. So the algebra is functions on the fiber, so essentially we're just looking at functions on this four manifold M. And to put it in a more invariant form, if we look at the one zero part, so when I uh, looked at the Higgs bundle equations from the holomorphic point of view, uh, what I said was that Higgs field uh, takes values in the one zero forms tensored with the, uh, the algebra bundle, then we can think of this as a section of the pullback under this projection of the canonical bundle of sigma, pull back to M uh, of a, so this, this line bundle, complex line bundle on M is the pullback of the canonical bundle of sigma. And then phi is uh, the section of that. So that's the data. Um, what about the equations? Well, okay, so, so here, okay, well, we haven't got onto the equations here. Okay, here I, I should have put inverted commas around here. So there is no group SL infinity R but what, by analogy with the SLNR, what Higgs field data do I need in order to find something which would uh, give me, uh, if you like, in finite dimensions, an SLNR connection? I would want my connection to be an SO infinity connection, which means that I have my distinguished circle bundle. And I would want my Higgs field to take values in M, in the orthogonal complement, of the algebra of SO infinity. So I'd want phi 1 and phi 2 to be even functions. And then the Poisson bracket is, is odd. But then note that because it's odd, it actually vanishes on this circle bundle. So this Poisson bracket here is a, a function. Actually, it's not quite a function because it's, it's really a, a section of the pullback of KK bar. But anyway, essentially, it's a, it's a section of a real line bundle. And it vanishes on this, uh, this circle bundle. So let's look now at the equations. So uh, first of all, the, the connection. So here I have uh, my covariant derivatives. So if I thought of A1 and A2 as being the uh, connection forms, the coefficients uh, with respect to x and y of a connection form, then this, the A1 and A2 should lie in the Lie algebra. In this case, it's the, the algebra of Hamiltonian vector fields. So what we've got here is, a, is basically a vector field on M, uh, which depends on, uh, okay, which depends on S, just a vector field on M, A1, A2. And the Higgs field, well, here we've got Hamiltonian vector fields depending on X and Y. 
So if you put these together, uh, so this is just a local, uh, local expression, then you'll see that the, the analog of the equation which says that this is a flat connection is, uh, is this. So what we have here is a, a complex uh, vector field and another complex vector field, and they, they commute under the V bracket. So what does that mean? Well, that means we've got a, a complex structure. We've got, we're on a four-dimensional manifold. We've got two complex uh, uh, vector fields. They commute, so the, the span of x1 and x2 is a, a two-dimensional subspace of the, uh, the complexified tangent bundle, and this is the, uh, the condition, the Nuremberger, uh, and the Newland and Nuremberg condition, uh, what it implies in Newland and Nuremberg condition for integrability of a complex structure. Now that's true so long as these things are linearly independent, which is a generic condition. So, uh, but, uh, but what does it mean? If you look at it in, in detail, you'll see that that'll be true if and only if these Hamiltonian vector fields are linearly independent at a point, at each point. On the other hand, if you think of phi 1 and phi 2 as being the Hamiltonian functions for these vector fields, then you get linear dependence where phi 1 and phi 2 and the Poisson bracket is equal to zero. So what this says is that we get on this hypersurface, uh, and possibly on a, a further hypersurface, but, uh, but certainly uh, on this hypersurface, which is determined by an SO infinity connection, this complex structure apparently breaks down. So, so our four manifold is divided in two by this uh, this hypersurface, and we have a complex structure on on each side. And as I say, in, uh, for SL infinity, we we can assume for the moment at least that this is the only uh, hypersurface on which this is defined. So this is this is just a circle a circle bundle. So if you like, we're, we've got a, a complex structure on a disk bundle on. Uh, so on the hemisphere in the two sphere over each point in sigma. Uh, on the other hand, if you shift these equations around, and then you'll see there are two similar equations, and uh, so we get two more complex structures, and that means that uh, what we have is uh, something called a hypercomplex manifold. But actually, if these are symplectic vector fields, which they are, then that means that this is hypercalar. So what we get here is a, a hyperkähler metric on, so it's got three complex structures, i, j, and k, which behave like quaternions, and it has a metric which, uh, which is kähler with respect to all three. So what we've, uh, what we've interpreted these uh, uh, solutions, S, SO infinity solutions uh, as, well, in fact, the SU infinity solutions would would also give us a hyperkähler metric, but it would be less clear uh, what that uh, hypersurface on which it degenerates is. Okay, so uh, so you know, so that's what that's an reinterpretation in geometrical terms, geometry of a certain type of hyperkähler metric of uh, what a, an a SO infinity, well, what an SU infinity Higgs bundle, which would correspond to SL infinity R flat connections, is so. So the only way that we can understand what's going on is to look at the, the canonical model because um, this one here, so this, what is this? This is a, an SU2 connection, but SU2 sits inside SU infinity, uh, at least, sorry, PSU2, forget about, I mean, SU infinity thought of a symplectic diffeomorphism is really the quotient by the center. Uh, so anyway, uh, in this case, as I say, we've got the real form, we've got SO2, and the Higgs field is in the opposite part. So this is, uh, this is going to give us a, uh, or a, a model example of one of these hyper, hyperkähler manifolds. So we need to understand uh, what it is. Well, uh, there are a number of ways of looking at this. Uh, one of them uh, goes back to the work of Kaledin and a former student of mine, Bertha Fikes, which says that actually, given any real analytic Kähler metric on a manifold, uh, okay, so I've called it here M, but anyway, on some manifold, there's a unique uh, S1 invariant hyperkähler extension 
to a neighborhood of the zero section in the cotangent bundle. So this is the complex cotangent bundle of M. It has, uh, uh, the circle action is just multiplication by e to the i theta in each fiber. And the two of the, uh, the hypercalar forms, uh, omega 2 and omega 3, are just the real and the imaginary parts of the canonical complex symplectic form on P star of M. So uh, if you start with, uh, in particular, with some known examples, so if you start with the two sphere, or the round two sphere, and then what you get this way is a, is a complete metric. It's the Gucci Hansen metric that Simon mentioned in his lecture this morning. On the other hand, if you start with the hyperbolic surface, uh, then we know for various reasons uh, that uh, there is no complete me hyperkähler metric on the cotangent bundle of sigma. Why? Because uh, there are various theorems uh, which say that when it, if it's complete with the Ricci tensor zero, then in particular the, the fundamental group has polynomial growth. Uh, but we know that, of course, for a hyperbolic metric, it has exponential growth. So I, I kind of, uh, I knew this all along, but um, I've often heard physicists talk, talk where they, 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 in the middle of it, they say, okay, well, the cotangent bundle of a surface is a hypercalar manifold, and so on and so forth. And I usually put up my hand and say, oh, wait a minute, uh, it's not because it's uh, incomplete. And uh, they say, it doesn't matter, we're just looking locally around the zero section. And uh, I, but I, I, to be honest, I'd never ask myself, uh, why is it incomplete? How does it go wrong? And so, um, so I decided to look into the literature uh, to see where anybody had uh, studied this metric before. So it's a kind of analytic continuation of the Aguchi Hansen metric. And as far as I know, okay, there's a couple of uh, papers. Well, this is a physics paper. <clears throat> this one is um, half physics, I suppose. It's half a former student of mine and a physicist. But actually, Simon Donaldson uh, uses it in uh, one of his papers, too. I, as you see, it's one of the surveys of differential geometry. Uh, so uh, the key feature about this is that if you look at the restriction of the Kähler form omega 1 to the, the fibers, so this is the the Kähler form, which goes with the complex structure of the, the complex the holomorphic symplectic manifold, the cotangent bundle, then it looks like this. So you can see easily that it's an incomplete metric because curves go, so it goes wrong on the unit circle bundle in the cotangent bundle. And, uh, and the curves tending towards that uh, unit circle are our finite length. On the other hand, if you, if you look at this, uh, so, well, we already know something. I mean, if what I said is correct, then we should be looking at some kind of geometry on a two-sphere bundle. <clears throat> anyway, what's happening here? So if you rewrite this, uh, this Kähler form in terms of uh, Euclidean coordinates, then you immediately recognize that if you think of the x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared equals 1 as being the two-sphere, then this is the standard uh, symplectic form on the two-sphere. So in these coordinates, the x1, x2 coordinates, it looks like it's singular, but actually it's, uh, it uh, extends to, it is well-defined on the two-sphere. And in fact, um, you find that uh, all three symplectic forms are, well, well, of course, the omega-2 and omega-3 are the real and imaginary parts of the canonical symplectic form, so they obviously extend beyond the on the cotangent bundle, but in fact they uh, they uh, okay, so they extend on also on uh, on this two sphere bundle. So so what is, so the canonical model looks like this. So you take a sigma the surface with the hyperbolic metric. You look at the cotangent bundle sitting inside this projectivized uh, cotangent bundle. The, at least the projective the project canonical projective completion of it. So that's a, a P one bundle over sigma. And then the hyperkähler extension of the hyperkähler metric on sigma is defined on the unit disk bundle inside here, and it extends to a hyperkähler, well, to, a, to some kind of singular hyperkähler metric on this two sphere bundle. Now, I've used this word folded <coughs> because there's a, an analogous procedure, which is uh, already in the 
literature. So let me just uh, so let me uh, divert, make a diversion now, and talk just about folding. So uh, so this is the standard fold. Okay, you just fold a piece of paper over. Here it is in coordinates. If I take the standard symplectic form in R2 and pull it back under this folding operation, then what I get is this, 2x dx was dy. So what I get here is a two-form which vanishes on x equals, x equals 0, on the line x equals 0, which is the, the fold. Okay, more generally, uh, if I have a symplectic manifold, uh, then it has a closed two-form, such as omega to the m is non-vanishing everywhere. Now, there's this notion of a folded symplectic manifold, which is where you have a closed two-form, where omega to the m top exterior power uh, vanishes uh, on a smooth uh, hypersurface. So it's a non-degenerate vanishing. And you also uh, insist that its restriction as a form to this hypersurface should have maximal rank. Uh, it turns out there's a normal form of that, which, so what does it look like? It looks like a folded, a fold, a two-dimensional fold, plus a symplectic one in uh, some other variables. Okay, so uh, these, these have been studied uh, uh, in the context of symplectic geometry, but uh, it's not a very strong condition. So there's this result in Zyko, which says that any compact oriented form manifold admits a folded Kähler structure, not just symplectic, but Kähler. Uh, so this means, what does this mean? It means that the form manifold is, has this, uh, this hypersurface inside it on which this uh, symplectic form degenerates. And on one hand, on, and, you have, and the complement of it, it consists of two uh, Kähler manifolds. It's just that the Kähler metric on one side is positive definite, and as you pass through the, the fold, it becomes negative definite on the other side. And that's actually what happens in this canonical example, that this two-sphere bundle over sigma, we have a, a hyperkähler manifold, hyperkähler metric on one disk bundle. It becomes singular in a certain fashion on N3, and then it becomes a negative definite hyperkähler metric on the other side. In fact, for the SO infinity situation, we have an involution uh, so it actually is isometric, but with the opposite sign, uh, the other side. Okay, well, that was a, uh, an aside, but how do we adapt this notion of, uh, of folding to hyperkähler geometry? So, uh, in four dimensions, uh, the equations for a hyperkähler metric are very simply stated, that you have, instead of thinking about a metric and three complex structures, if you just think about the, the forms, omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3, the corresponding Kähler forms, then they satisfy these, uh, these relations. This is the, the wedge product. And they satisfy, of course, the relation that these are symplectic forms, so these are everywhere non-zero. If you know, if you have three closed two forms which satisfy these relations, you can reconstruct the metric and the complex structures. So, for example, by raising and lowering indices, the, the metric is given, given by this. So that's, that's a, a hyperkähler, four-dimensional hyperkähler manifold. So, obviously, if you, if you want one of these symplectic forms to be folded, then it vanishes on some uh, hypersurface. Uh, well, the square of it vanishes on some hypersurface, but these relations tell you that all three uh, symplectic forms also vanish. Uh, on that same hypersurface. Uh, <clears throat> but now it turns out that there are two different types of vanishing. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but, um, but this is really the geometry of the Klein quadric. So if you want, you can think about, think about uh, a point on this hypersurface and think about the the fiber of the bundle of exterior two forms on M at that point. That's a, a six-dimensional vector space with, uh, 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 of two forms. And uh, this is basically a null. So if I have omega 1 squared equals 0, if the, all these are 0 and these are 0, then that's a, a null plane. It's a, a three-dimensional subspace 
on which this uh, quadratic form given by the wedge product is zero. And in classical geometry, we know that in a quadric, uh, a four-dimensional quadric, there are alpha planes and beta planes. Anyway, it means that there are different ways in which uh, these vanish. So this down here is what you would really call a folded uh, hyperkähler manifold because uh, each of these forms is in canonical form. But in other words, it's, uh, it vanishes in just the same way as the, the normal form where I symplectic manifold, which is folded. Uh, but they only correspond to these beta planes. So there's, uh, there's another one, uh, which is, is this type here. So two of the forms uh, are, if you like, folded in the standard way, and this one is rather, rather different, because here you see if I restrict to x equals zero, restrict as a form to x equals zero, then it vanishes identically. So the uh, basically the difference is if you put x equal to zero, then these, uh, okay, well, in terms of the Klein quadric, these correspond to the lines in P3, which line a plane. These correspond to the lines in P3, which go to the point. Anyway, the point I want to make is that in the canonical model, it's this type of fold which, which you actually get. So the, uh, the two forms, the, the hyperkähler two forms, degenerate according to this, this type. Okay, so then it comes down to, you know, what is the intrinsic geometry of that fold, that uh, three-dimensional uh, hypercircle? So, uh, well, first of all, um, let's think of it this way. So, um, so the Higgs field is a section of the pullback of the canonical bundle of sigma to m. We can think of that as a map, a smooth map from the manifold to the cotangent bundle, to the total space of this cotangent bundle. And when you do that, the Higgs field then just becomes the pullback of the canonical one form on the cotangent bundle. I've written it here in terms of local coordinates. So I want to think of Z as a, a local holomorphic coordinate on sigma, and W as a standard uh, coordinate in the fiber. And then the, the two, uh, uh, two forms, uh, omega 2 and omega 3, are just given by the pullback of the derivative of this, the pullback of the canonical symplectic two form on the canonical one. <laughs> okay, so the picture then is this: that here we have uh, our we have our two sphere bundle over here, and we have half of it. So the hyperkähler metric is well defined on this hemisphere, and the map F, which is essentially the Higgs field, uh, maps it to some if you like, non-quadratic circle bundle, which lies inside the, the cotangent bundle. So you can think of this as being, okay, so Finsler geometry is basically the geometry, Finsler geometry of a surface is basically the geometry of a circle bundle, of a non-quadratic type circle bundle in the tangent bundle, but with the right type of convexity, uh, the Legendre transform will take you from one tangent bundle to the cotangent. So essentially, this geometry on the uh, on the fold is uh, is Finsel geometry. Uh, so, okay. So now, how, but how else do we do we describe this? So we now have these hyperkähler forms near the fold. Uh, I s assume that they behave in this fashion, and then if I restrict the fold, then I get these closed two forms like this. Okay. So it's just putting x equal to zero. And so on the image, uh, we can look at, uh, so what are these? These are just the, the restrictions of the real and the imaginary parts of the holomorphic symplectic form. So if you like, the real part is just the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent one. So, uh, so again, on this f of n, so this is this non-quadratic circle bundle, then you can look at the annihilator of these two one forms. That's a, so, the one forms themselves are not uh, well defined because it's just the wedge product, which is. But nevertheless, the common zero of these two is, uh, gives you a one-dimensional foliation. In fact, what is it? It's just, it's just the, the you restrict the canonical symplectic form on the cotangent bundle, and its degeneracy. Uh, it has a degeneracy foliation on this three-dimensional manifold, which is this. 
So and this is uh, it's only a foliation, but for example, if you locally describe your hypersurface by a function, the vanishing of a function, then the Hamiltonian flow of that function would uh, go along this one dimension of foliation. And if we look at the other, uh, the beta 2, uh, then that restricts to this uh, as, a, as a parameter on the integral, integral curves of this foliation. And what about the, the form phi, which runs through all these, uh, so the phi is the form which is, uh, when x is equal to zero, runs through all of these. Uh, then this is uh, the annihilator of that. It gives you horizontal subspaces on this circle bundle, which is the diff S1, diffeomorphism, diff S1 connection. So uh, out at infinity, you, you do see, uh, what do you see? You see that this... Uh, connection, this diff S1 connection exists, but anyway, what we're looking at is, uh, is basically a geodesic structure. Indeed, on the canonical model, uh, what are we getting? We're just getting the unit circle bundle for the hyperbolic metric in the cotangent bundle, but you can think of it in the, in the uh, tangent bundle if you like. The foliation is now just the geodesic flow, and uh, this beta 2 is just, just the length. So, at the moment then, what have I got? I've got uh, my canonical model, and I have this hyperkähler metric, and the, the boundary data, which it seems to define, uh, relates to the geodesic flow with respect to the hyperbolic metric on that surface. Um, let me just say two things now about um, complexification. So, from the point of view of Higgs bundles for a finite dimensional Lie group. Uh, the thing that is missing in this uh, picture is the, the flat connection. Uh, because the complexification of the group doesn't really exist as a group. So, on the other hand, as uh, Simon has pointed out in many papers, uh, there are substitutes. So, for example, if you think of the, the space of Kähler potentials on the two sphere, functions like this, then uh, this, although it's not a group, uh, you can formally relate this to, uh, to a complexification of the group of uh, symplectic diffeomorphisms, and you can discuss uh, symmetric spaces. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you do that, then one way of kind of interpreting what happens is to say that uh, this uh, fiber bundle here, that the hyperkähler metric that I'm talking about, can be, by analogy, you could think of it as a flat connection on the bundle of, uh, in this case, folded Kähler potentials uh, over sigma, folded Kähler potentials on the two sphere. So uh, the flat connection doesn't, of course, require the group, it just requires the, the Lie bracket, but, uh, but there's a formal way in which you can think of it that way. And then the hyperkähler three, uh, form omega-3 restricted to a fiber will be a section of this uh, bundle of uh, Kähler potentials, or section of the symmetric space. And then, formally speaking, it's a, it's a harmonic section. So, so somehow, rather than thinking of geodesics in this infinite dimensional, uh, infinite dimensional symmetric space, these equations are rather like looking for a harmonic map from the surface into one of these things. That's a remarkable analogy. I don't think, I don't know whether it helps in, in solving these equations at all. Anyway, so, so let me get back now to what my original motivation was. So all I've done is I've, I've reformulated the Higgs bundle equations for SU infinity, or in particular SO infinity or SL in infinity, R, in terms of the geometry of some hyperkähler metric, which uh, has a singularity on this uh, circle bundle over the surface. So, uh, okay, so here, if we go back to the finite dimensional uh, situation, then the, the vector space, then the Higgs bundle theory tells you that these higher Teichmuller spaces are, uh, are diffeomorphic to Rn, but they're diffeomorphic by you in fact, to the vector space, which is the direct sum of the differentials of degree 2 up to n on the Riemann surface. So the question is, is there an analog, when I say for SL infinity R, I mean for 
the type of hyperkähler metric that I'm looking at. Is there an analog of these uh, Teichmuller components? Uh, and does it parameterize some kind of geodesic structure on the surface which generalizes uh, the hyper geodesics of the hyperbolic metric? So I, so maybe, maybe it is a Finsler metric. Maybe it's something which depends on the Finsler metric. So rather like, um, as you may know, a projective structure is basically uh, where you think of unparameterized geodesics. So it's conceivable that somehow, uh, although, uh, if you like, I use a complex structure on the Riemann surface to derive this description of a hyperkähler metric, uh, part of the information at infinity may, may depend on that choice of complex structure. And what we're looking for is something which is independent. Anyway, so the point is, does there exist a, an analog? Is there a, a, a space, some infinite dimensional uh, vector space, which is analogous to Teichmann space, but which parameterizes these geodesic structures? And the mechanism would be the hyperkähler metric of the type I've described. Well, uh, all I can do at the moment is to offer two pieces of evidence. So the first one is this, that if we look at these higher Teichmuller spaces, then from the Higgs bundle point of view, there is a, a circle action on them. So for any, for any Higgs bundle, there's always a circle action on the moduli space, given by multiplying the Higgs field by e to the i theta. And even when you're looking at uh, the ones which, okay, so even when the Higgs, the Higgs field lies inside the m uh, of the h plus m, then e to the i theta still happens. And in these higher Teichmuller spaces, there's a unique fixed point. In fact, you can just think, see what it is. I mean, the Teichmuller space is isomorphic to this sum of vector spaces. The action uh, is, uh, is given actually by e to the i m theta on each one of these. So the origin is the unique fixed point. Uh, and what is that, in terms of flat connections, what is that unique fixed point? It's the uniformizing representation for the complex structure which you're using to uh, write these Higgs bundle equations down. So uh, the obvious question is, is, is the canonical model, the one I've just described, the only S1 invariant folded hyperkähler manifold of this type? So, well, so here's where SU infinity comes in again. So actually, so S1 invariance, if we're looking at a four-dimensional manifold, a four-dimensional hyperkähler metric, which is invariant under the action of a circle, so this would be an action which doesn't preserve all three symplectic forms, but uh, fixes one and rotates the other two, then these equations were written a long time ago. In fact, they're called the SU infinity Toda equation, but I think... They were, before that, they were called the Finlay, the Boyer-Finley equations, or uh, even before that, maybe the, uh, from the work of Plevansky and others. So anyway, they, it's the local formula that looks like this. It's a nonlinear second-order elliptic differential equation. And I mentioned here the, that it's called the SU infinity Toda equation because the actual Toda equation for a finite dimensional or for SLN, can be interpreted as looking at the fixed points in the moduli space of Higgs bundles, which are invariant under a finite subgroup of S1 of order n. So if I, if I want to look at SLN Toda equation, then that's, that can be spelled out in terms of looking at the fixed points under the action of the finite cyclic group of order n. So when n goes to infinity, uh, you can e imagine that as being the SU infinity Toda equation, but really what happens is that this, in the genuine Toda equation, this term here is a, a second order difference equation involving some UIs which uh, are collected together with the, the Cartan matrix. So there's actually a very, a very uh, sensible way in which you can think of this second order differential equation as being the limit of some uh, difference equations which are associated to SUN. I mean, that's just a comment. Anyway, this, so this is the local form, but, but globally, we're looking at uh, this, this equation here. So 
I'm on a, a, a Riemann surface, and I'm looking at a, a metric which depends on a, on a t, on a parameter t, and satisfies this equation where k is here the, the Gaussian curvature. So, uh, so basically, uh, so the question is, uh, is, there a, is the only solution to this equation on a surface, the only solution which satisfies the right boundary conditions in order to be uh, a hyper, to define a hyperkähler metric of the type that I'm talking about, is the only solution the hyperbolic uh, metric? Well, uh, let me explain what these G, this G is. So in the context of the problem I'm looking at, uh, G is actually, uh, if you like, you pull back the canonical one form on the cotangent model, look at theta, theta bar. So it's, it looks, this is what G is. So, so G is a metric, but at G equals uh, zero, so T equals zero is the zero section. So T is, in fact, essentially the moment map for this circle action. So, um, so we look at, I'm looking at the evolution of this metric. Uh, maybe evolution is the wrong, uh, wrong expression because t, because this is a second derivative in t. But anyway, I'm looking at the way in which this, uh, this metric evolves under t. Uh, but what we have, we have another metric on the, on the surface because, because we can take the Kähler quotient. So we have this... Uh, Hyperkähler metric, we have a circle action on it. I can look at the Kähler quotient, so a fixed value of t. I can look at the at t, uh, the quotient of the level set of t by the circle action, and that's a, a Kähler quotient, and the, the, the Kähler quotient metric is the derivative of this one with respect to t. So I actually have a, a condition that I know that this derivative is greater than zero. And the fold, the condition of the fold is that the derivative should be zero. So t equals one is the fold. So if you like, what I've got is uh, I've got this uh, nonlinear elliptic equation, and I've got I suppose I've got mixed boundary conditions. This is uh, this is Dirichlet at one end and Neumann at the other end. Anyway, <coughs> what you do notice about the first one is that, uh, of course, the conformal structure is unchanging. Right? I mean, dz, dz bar. So, so, <coughs> so w, is, uh, w is varying, but uh, we're not changing the conformal structure. So, uh, so what happens? Well, uh, if you look at this equation here, if you integrate this, then, of course, by gauss bonnet the right-hand side is fixed. So that means that the volume is some quadratic, total volume is some quadratic function of t. And if you rescale g uh, to a constant volume metric, h, and then write h in terms of a hyperbolic metric, in terms of a function f, you get this equation here. And then if you look at those boundary conditions and use a maximum principle, you'll find that f equals constant is the only solution. So, uh, so this is uh, so this this is true. So the the only S one invariant uh, hyperkähler metric of this type is actually the one generated by by the hyperbolic metric. Uh, the other piece of evidence is perhaps uh, a bit less convincing, but uh, but it's this that uh, suppose I look at the deformations of this uh, the one generated by the hyperbolic metric. Then for higher Teichmuller space, the infinitesimal first order deformations are basically given by this, uh, these holomorphic sections. So the, the vector space uh, measures the first order deformations of the uh, solution. So is it true in this uh, general situation? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, one of the things, so, okay, so what are these, where do you get these differentials of different degrees from in the finite dimensional case? You get them from looking at the invariant polynomials uh, of the Lie group uh, applied to the, the Higgs field. And basically, the higher Teichmuller space is a section of this. Given, given these differentials, there's a unique point uh, which, which has these invariants, a unique point in the higher Teichmuller space. So in this uh, setup, I, I mentioned earlier that the analog between uh, the compact group and SU infinity uh, extended to the fact that there were these, uh, these invariant polynomials. 
And so what are they in this case? So, so basically, you, I, I talked about the map F from my disk bundle, my hemisphere bundle, to the cotangent bundle of sigma. So if you take, uh, if you like, if you take the canonical one form, so W dz, raise it to the mth power, and then integrate against the symplectic form, so that's the push forward of the symplectic form on the two sphere, then this, uh, an integrate over the whole, uh, whole of the disk bundle, this gives you the corresponding differential. So uh, what, what one would hope is that uh, there's an infinitesimal deformation of hyperkalometrics corresponding to an infinitesimal change in these uh, moments, if you like. These are called the moments of a symplectic form on, on C. Uh, well, it happens that you can do this. So, okay, so anyway, you can define a, a complex vector field here just by vari contracting various canonical objects. And if you look at the real part of it, and take the, so what, contracting what kind of objects? So that we have this canonical one form, the Poisson tensor, that's the inverse of the symplectic form, the emission form of the hyperbolic metric, and this is a holomorphic section of k to the m. So you form out of a holomorphic differential of degree m, you form a vector field, a real vector field, and it turns out that the Lie derivatives of these closed two forms are all anti-self-dual. And this, this gives you uh, an infinitesimal variation in the hyperkähler metric. So I've chosen this particular one. And if you, if you work with this, you find that the infinitesimal variation in the polynomial invariant is the original differential that you started with. So if you like, there's one infinitesimal calculation around the canonical model. And there's a, a, a more global result uh, here about uh, the S1 invariance. So those are two pieces of evidence that there are uh, more general hyperkähler metrics of this type than the canonical model. I don't have a, a, an existence theorem for these. I have various ideas about how to approach it. But the end result, I hope, would be that uh, we can uh, define some space of possibly Finsler structures or possibly the geodesics associated to Finsler structures, modulo diffeomorphisms, which is parameterized by uh, some infinite dimensional vector space, which uh, essentially will be the, well, you could think of it in terms of this direct sum, but it'd be better to think of it as the space of uh, holomorphic functions on the total space of the tangent bundle of sigma maybe with some, some growth conditions. So I feel certain that there is some, there's some geometry out there which is parameterized by this infinite dimensional uh, vector space, and which is in some ways analogous to Teichmann space. It should have an action of the mapping class group on it, etc., etc. Et but it requires a lot more work, and uh, well, I, neither I nor any of my collaborators have really got down to starting to do that. But maybe I should finish that. So this is this equation. Yeah. Oh right. Well, actually, I wasn't aware of that. No. Uh, uh, so this very same equation. Um, okay. I wasn't. So this is what the the. Maldacena and Gaud. Ah, okay. I must. I must. Uh, yeah, that's that's another question. So I mean, so on the one hand, if there's yeah, okay. That's a good question, because if, if, as I'm saying, that there should be to each collection of differentials a hyperkähler metric of this type, then uniqueness is usually easier to prove than the existence. Um, yeah, okay, that's probably the first thing to, first thing to look at, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another point. I mean, so it, it is true that uh, when n equals 3, uh, <coughs> Choi, Goldman and Choi showed that there is, in fact, the, the convex real projective structures are parameterized by this, uh, <coughs> this uh, Teichmuller space. And this, it's, it's true. This is a description I'm perfectly happy with because it involves nice, smooth objects that we know a lot about. And that, in a sense, that, um, that's, that's another point at which one might start the investigation. So the, the brackets, so the Lie bracket in S, SU3 is not the same as, as the Poisson bracket, but it's the, the first case where these, these are different. And so it's, it is conceivable that actually, in that case, the same structure might be parameterized by slightly different differential equations. Um, in other words, the behavior of infinity might, in a suitable of, of the, uh, the three manifolds, or, or these, it's possible, but uh, now that I think about it, I'm, I'm less sure. So these are, these are projective structures. So, okay, so, so one of the things I should mention is that, um, this is about projective structures. Um, my non-quadratic circle bundle need not be symmetric about, uh, about the origin. So, Finsler structures uh, have the property that uh, a geodesic from A to B may not be the same as a geodesic from B to A. One of the standard examples is where you, you try to cross a river, you try to go from A to B across a river in shortest time. And you can rephrase that in the language of a Finsler metric. But of course, as you well know, if you, the path you need to take from go to A to B when, you, when it's going that, that way is different from the path the other way. And so, so projective, so one would have to check to see whether for n equals 3, even the, whether this is a symmetric, actually a symmetric Finsler structure. Because, the, I mean, n equals 3 is, is a projective structure supposed to, you're just parameterizing the curves and they're parameterized by pointing the projectivization of that two sphere, of that circle. So, but on the other hand, it's the first case where uh, there, there is a geometric, a known geometric uh, object which parameterizes it, but that doesn't mean that there isn't something uh, slightly different which has the same, same property. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I should say, you know, one of the possible approaches to this is to say, let's take a solution to the SLN Higgs bundle equations and think of that as defining an approximate hyperkähler metric. So again, the brackets in SLN are not the same as the Poisson brackets, and so there must be some uh, discrepancy between the, you know, in the equations, but maybe it gets smaller uh, if you vary certain parameters. So I think looking at finite dimensional ones in this context is, is certainly a Yeah. 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 Well, that that's okay. So the, uh, this is the thing which uh, I don't like. Well, not that I don't like. It's a, it's a it's a part of mathematics that which uh, I, which is not uh, if you like classical geometry. So this is a good point that uh, that my. Yeah, but that's uh, that's a slightly different one. Um, so w w one of the one of the things I, I feel about this is that uh, the non-smoothness in the uh, Guichard, Laboury, Wienhardt uh, approach is in there. That we have some Holder continuity or something like that. That's what I don't like. But on the other hand, when n goes to infinity, I believe there's a nice smooth picture. So there's some sense in which I believe that you could say that. The classical geometry is when n goes to infinity, and for finite n, it's some kind of quantum version of this. You know? And so that one might expect some kind of fractal uh, behavior. So, but the, but the, the limiting case is certainly this n equals 3. And so I think, I think indeed, it uh, requires more, more investigation there. 